All right, kids, good morning. So let's continue where we left off. Um, I'm pulling up the slides right now. It's gonna take a moment for them to completely load. So we're almost done with this chapter. We're gonna be finishing it off today and we're gonna be then starting um, the concepts of stereochemistry and that's gonna be the preamble to then start talking about uh, carbohydrates. So we're officially starting the biochemistry portion of the course at some point during today's lecture. So let me get to the right slide. We were already talking about buffers. Um, hold on, it's coming. It's just that there's a lot of slides in this presentation. All right, so we were just about here. All right, so we had started talking about buffers the last time, and we had um, sort of described the concept of the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which is what's shown here at that sort of top of this slide. That's going to be the, our guiding light in terms of how to design, how to prepare a buffer, and then understanding what are the changes that need to be made in order for a buffer to do one thing or another. Uh, the whole point of a buffer, as we're going to discuss towards the end of the presentation uh, in the context of physiological systems, is to maintain the pH of a solution within a very, very narrow range. So it's very important that you understand that the buffer does not maintain a constant pH. It just, within the ability of the buffer to neutralize acid or base that's added from an external source, which depends on how much base or acid in terms of the salt ratio that we talked about is present in the solution, we're going to talk about that as well. It's called the buffer capacity. So the capacity of the buffer is how much acid or base it can handle. As long as the amount of acid or base that's added from an outside source does not overwhelm or completely destroy the components of the buffer that are actually doing the buffering, then the buffer will maintain a very narrow range of pH change. And in the case of physiological systems, as we're going to discuss, this is going to be a critical piece uh, of critical importance to the maintenance of, of you know, life as we know it. So um, we're going to just simply consider a simple buffer. I think we sort of left off at this point. Um, let me see. I believe we had started talking that no, we actually had finished this slide as well. So again, uh, we were going to start talking about the preparation of buffers and starting with the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation shown here, just to recap what this equation is telling us, pKa, as we know, is a constant. This is a number that each acid has its own value depending on its strength. Stronger acids have lower pKa's, weaker acids have higher pKa's. When you're designing a buffer of a particular desired pH, you have to pick an acid whose pKa is as close as possible to the desired pH, and then what you are going to modulate in the preparation uh, process in the laboratory is what is the ratio that the conjugate base to the acid need to be such that when you calculate that ratio, apply the log, you want this number, the log of that ratio, to be a small number such that it doesn't change the pKa of the acid by much, and therefore your pH is going to remain within a small, narrow range of that pKa. So you're going to choose an acid whose pKa is as close as possible to the desired pH, then you're going to determine what does this ratio have to be in order to bring that pH to within whatever small range of that desired pKa. So if you solve this equation, let me clean up this mess that suddenly arose here by me writing. If you solve this equation for the ratio, what you're going to get is this. So notice, I put the pKa to the left. It becomes pH minus pKa. That equals the log of this then you have to elevate 10 to that difference of pH minus pKa, and that's what's going to tell you the ratio, okay? So, whoop, wrong button, here we go. So, with this in mind, unfortunately, the slide's a little bit distorted, but the question is asking, so if you have a need in, for whatever situation, you have to prepare a buffer of pH 4.3 and you're given three different acids to choose from that are gonna be the choices of, um, you know what, let, let, me, let me try something different here. I'm going to, just bear with me one second. Again, this is all 
new territory for all of us. I'm going to try to upload the PDF, which I think is actually cleaner. Um, and hold on, bear with me one moment. I think that one is going to be better. PDFs are usually better than than real Word files, Excel files, and PowerPoints and things doing these screen sharing types of things. So just bear me one second while I'm uploading that alternative file, which I think is going to be uh, better. The only thing that that file does not have is the is any clicker questions, but it's okay. We're not doing attendance and participation anyway at this point. All right, so let me see if this is going to be better. Just bear with me. I think the slides are going to be clearer. All the distortion is going to go away. All right, we're getting there. All right, so we're at the buffers. This is where we are. So let's go with this, okay? And um, trying to see if I can zoom into this thing. Not sure that I can. So now this is too small, right? Again, you can't win. So let's go back. My apologies. So we're back on this one. We're going to share this one again. And now I have to wait until I get to the right slide. Oh, you can? OK. Well, I have to figure out for me to zoom in. But um, hold on. Oh, here it is. Hello. All right, I'm good. We're good. All right, so never mind the other file. We're going to stick with this one. All right, so now if you observe, this is the ratio that you need to establish or achieve in order to reach this pH if you're starting with an acid that has this pKa. So you need to prepare a buffer that is a pH of 4.3, right? The question is, you have three choices of acids. Which of these acids is the best one? Now, of course, this is given in Ka's, which is not really very useful. But remember, the log function, P K, minus log of whatever it is, in this case would be minus log of Ka to give you pKa, gives you a measure of the 10. So it's going to be one of these two, because these are the ones that are closest to 4.3. This is going to definitely be off the table. But of course, the easiest way to do this is to simply convert those Ka's to pKa's. And if you observe, chloroacetic acid has a pKa of 2.87. Propanoic acid has a pKa of 4.87. And then this one, as we already have established, is too high. So this is going to be off the table. But if you pay close attention, you'll notice that of the two that we sort of mentioned, this is the one that's the closest to 4.3. As long as it is within one pH unit, so anywhere up to 5.3, anywhere down to 3.3, if it falls anywhere within that range, that's the acid that's going to be the optimal. If you happen to find an acid that has a pKa that's exactly 4.3, then what that then means is that the ratio of these two is going to equal one. They're going to coexist in a one or 50% of one, 50% of the other. Now, because our pKa is a little bit higher than the desired pH, meaning looking at it from the opposite perspective, our, the desired pH is a little bit lower than the pKa of the acid that we have available to us. What that means is that there's going to be a little bit more of the acidic component than there is of the basic component, because we want to make that pH a little bit more acidic than the pKa of the acid. So that's sort of the rationale how you, how you figure this out. OK, so now that we've established that we're going to use propanoic acid, whose pKa is 4.87, the question is, what is the mole ratio at which you have to combine the conjugate base of the acid to the acid in order to reach a pH of 4.87. So all you're doing is you're putting in the desired pH, from it you're subtracting the pKa of the acid, 
you're elevating 10 to that difference. So this is where you have to be very mindful of how do you enter that information into your calculator to ensure that you're getting that number correctly, right? And everybody should be practicing this right now on your calculator. You should be getting 0.27 rounding to the proper number of significant figures. Remember, when you're doing significant figures using these powers of 10, you're looking at the number of decimal places after the whole number. In this case, it's going to be two decimal places. That then tells you you're going to have an answer with two significant figures, which happens to be two decimal places as well in this particular uh, example. So now you can solve for one variable in, in terms of the other. What this means then is that whatever amount of acid you have, 27% of that will be the amount of base that you need. So notice the base is going to be a fraction of acid, what we've already then established, which was what we mentioned earlier, that you're going to have more acid than base in the solution because this is a solution whose pH is less than, i.e., more acidic than the pKa of the acid that's used to make it. So then in reality, if you, if, what, what you really need to uh, realize is that how many grams of the acid and then obviously the base do I need to measure in order to prepare my buffer? So remember, there's no instrument on planet Earth that when you take a sample and put it in, this, in, the, in the instrument is going to read out number of moles of anything. The only thing that you can measure is mass if you have a balance. You can measure volumes if you have liquids. You would need the density of the liquid in order to determine the mass, but you ultimately need to get the mass of compounds to be able to work with them and establish amounts of this and amounts of that. So the question then becomes how many grams of propanoic acid and propanoate, which can be in the form of any salt of propanoate, sodium, potassium, lithium, whatever. It's typically easier to use a uh, one that has a one-to-one -one ratio of metal to non-metal because it's just easier to make the calculations. So sodium propanoate has one sodium associated with one propanoate, and that's the easiest way to do it. What's truly happening is that the proton on the acid is being replaced by sodium. Ultimately, you're trying to figure out how many moles of propanoate do I need to measure and how many moles of propanoic acid I need to measure. So how many grams of each of the two do I need to measure? So in reality, it turns out that you can start with any mass of one of them. And once you've established how many grams of one of them you have handy, then you have to determine how many grams of the other uh, species you need to then determine. Now, of course, depending on how concentrated you want your solution, you can add more or less of the species, but the ratio always, the mole ratio always needs to be the same, which is that 0.27 that we calculated on the previous slide. But technically, you, any mass, you have to pick one. I'm going to have this many grams of this one, and then I have to calculate, calculate how many grams of the other one I need to mix in order for the ratio of them to be at what it needs to be. In this case, it happens to be a ratio of 0.27 base to acid. So what the henderson hasselbach equation is actually relating, let me see if that was on, it's not on the previous slide, but it's coming up again. What that henderson hasselbach equation, Hen hasselbach equation is actually relating is a ratio of molar concentrations. Now, because both substances are coexisting in the same solution, that ratio of molar concentrations is numerically identical to the mole ratio, ratio of actual moles of compounds. Then you can actually relate the moles of each compound to its mass using molar mass, as we've been doing pretty much since the beginning of the course uh, in the last semester. So what we need to then establish is, once you have a certain number of grams of one compound, how many moles does that correspond to? Then I need to relate that to the number of moles of the second compound, and then I need to convert that to particular number of grams of that second compound to then prepare the solution properly. So this is the next slide is illustrating. So again, back to how many grams. Let me zoom in because I'm going to be writing on this one to calculate the um, number of grams of the second compound given a certain amount of the first one. So here you happen to, you're in the lab, you're preparing this buffer that's pH 4.3. You've already established that you need um, a ratio of 0.27 of uh, conjugate base to acid 
go into your into your laboratory uh, stock room and you're trying to find the let's say I'm going to find the acid first. It doesn't matter which one you start with. I'm going to start with the acid first. The acid is a liquid, and let's say I have handy 25 mL of that liquid of that propanoic acid. Question is how much sodium propanoate? This is a salt. It's a solid. It turns out. So then you need to weigh it. Go into the lab. Put in a little weigh boat into the laboratory. Trying to do a little virtual lab over here at the same time, right? You know, put in your little balance in there, take your little scoop and start adding. You have to figure out how much of the sodium propanoate I need to mix with the 25 mL of the propanoic acid such that their mole ratio is 0.27. So the first thing I need to do is determine how many moles of propanoic acid I have to then be able to relate that by virtue of this 0.27 is going to be the conversion factor, if you will, that's going to allow me to relate that many moles of acid to the number of moles of base that I need. And then using the mass of the base, I can calculate how many grams of the base. So if I have 25 mL of the acid, let's call it HA, because this is sort of the generic uh, nomenclature. What is true? Well, I have to use the density to convert it to grams. So I know that 1 mL is 0 0.990 grams. That converts my uh, volume to a number of grams. And then I use the molar mass to determine how many moles of the compound I have, right? So I have, I know for information given here, right, that 74.08 grams of the acid is one mole, right? So this tells me how many moles of acid I have. So everybody should be pulling out their calculator right now. And then we're going to make this math 25 times 0.99 divided by 74.08. 74.08. And, and this comes to 0 0.33409 dot, 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 right? So technically, I should be rounding this to three significant figures. So we're talking about this number. Now, remember, you're going to need this number. Um, this is moles of HA, right? This is the propanoic acid, right? So now I have to determine how many moles of the sodium propanoate I'm going to need. So remember, I'm not. I'm going to carry this whole number, right? Don't don't round too early because otherwise you're going to be in problems. So I'm going to transfer this number down here. So I know that the um, actually I'm going to transfer it in a moment. So A minus which is the base, is going to equal 0.27 times HA, right? So this is where I'm going to put this number. This is 0.27 times 0 0.33409 dot, 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 right? So I'm going to multiply that by 0.27. And that's going to give me, I'm going to write it on the top right because I'm running out of space over here, uh, 0 0.090. 206 dot dot dot. This is moles of A minus. This is how many moles of the sodium propanoate I need. So once you've established how many moles of acid you have, the equation tells you you need this many. This is the fraction that you have to multiply by the moles of HA as per the calculation we already did to determine how many moles of base. So this is what this is what I get, right? And then, of course, I'm going to multiply that by the molar mass, which is given here. I know that one mole is 96.07 grams. So now, if I multiply that number, still carrying all the numbers, right, that you should be in your calculator, times 96.07 this comes to, and this is where I'm rounding. This is the end. And what's limiting here is the, 20, is the 0.27. So I'm rounding to two significant figures, 8.7 grams, right? 8.7 grams. OK, everybody's with me? So what, what we have established is that if you have 25 ml of propanoic acid, you can then you would need to add 8.7 grams of sodium propanoate to that 25 ml of propanoic acid. And then you add water. The amount of water, how much, it doesn't matter. Depending on how much water you add is how concentrated or dilute your solution will be. So you can take that 25 ml 
you can take that 8.7 grams, you can put them in a 100 ml volumetric flask, you can put them in a 250 ml volumetric flask, you can put them in a 500 ml volumetric flask, add water to the line of each of those. Of course, the one that's in the 100 ml would be more concentrated. The one that it's in the 500 is going to be less concentrated because the final volume is going to be much greater. So the, the species are more dilute. Okay? So, but the mole ratio of, in all three of those solutions is exactly the same. If I were to take a pH meter and put it inside each of those three solutions, the pH would read exactly the same because they have exactly the same mole ratio of the two substances. What's different, again, is the concentration. So if I were to take identical samples, let's say I take 20 ml of the 100 ml, the 250 ml, or the 500 ml solutions, at that point, the more concentrated one is the one that has the greater ability to withstand changes in pH than the more dilute one, if you were to add the same amount of acid or base from an external source. So more concentration simply makes it a better buffer. Less concentration makes it a weaker buffer if you're adding the same amount of acid or base. But as long as that mole ratio, regardless of how much water is in there as the final volume, as long as the mole ratio is what it is, does it matter the volume? The pH will be exactly the same. Okay? Everybody's with me? So let me, I'm going to erase this. So technically what you would be doing, I'm just going to try to do a little, uh, little cartoon over here, right? So you're going to take your volumetric flask, and then to that volumetric flask, I'm going to be adding the 25 ml of acid. I'm adding the 8.7 grams of the conjugate base, right? So I'm going to do that as a solid over here, right? I'm attempting to draw a little solid. And then I'm adding H2O, right? to whatever the volume is, right? And then once the liquid is in there, right, it gets to a certain volume, that mole ratio is 0.27 A minus over HA. That then produces a solution whose pH is 4.30, okay? All right, so again, I mean, there's all kinds of different buffers that are can be prepared for all kinds of reasons. Very, very common in working with physiological systems, UDH that has a solution that has a pH of 7.3, right? 7.3 to 7.4, which is physiological pH. So, of course, you're not going to choose propanoic acid because the pKa is too low. You need to choose an acid whose pKa is uh, much closer. So, if actually, if I go back a couple of slides here, the acid that we were talking about last time, this, this species here, this is a perfect, perfect, perfect acid to use for preparing a physiological buffer. Because notice, it doesn't get much closer than 7.3, 7.4, something that has pK of 7.21. So it's very, very common to use these dihydrogen phosphate, hydrogen phosphate buffers to uh, prepare these buffers. So again, we're talking about HPO4 2 minus over HP, H2PO4 minus. This is the A minus. This is the HA, right? And this acid has a pKa of 7.21. So it's very, very common to prepare these physiological buffers by measuring a certain amount of sodium hydrogen phosphate and sodium dihydrogen phosphate. As long as you get the right ratio, notice if I want a, a buffer whose pH is, let's say, 7.35, the pH is higher than the pKa. If it's higher, i.e. more basic, what does that mean? There needs to be more of the basic component in the solution than there is of the acidic component. So that ratio is going to be greater than 1. In the case of the one that we just saw, where you wanted to prepare a buffer of pH 4.3 using an acid of pKa, I believe it was 4.87, because your pH is less than the pKa, it's more acidic, that ratio of, H of a, uh, a minus to HA needed to be less than one, right? Less than one. This is written backwards, less than one, right? And that's why it was ultimately 0.27. Okay, so let's erase this whole nonsense over here and let's move on to the next, to where we were, so that we can move on. All right, so this is the concept of buffer capacity that I was mentioning. So again, let's say you have a buffer who's uh, containing 
0.1 molar sodium citrate, 0.1 molar citric acid. So it's at one to one ratio of the two substances. In this case, I hope you can appreciate the pH will be exactly equal to the pKa because if that ratio is one, the log of one is zero, pH equals pKa, right? Now, if you have a second buffer that has one molar sodium citrate and one molar, one molar citric acid, the ratio is again one to one, and here it's again one to one. So the pH is gonna be exactly the same. These two solutions have exactly the same pH equals to the pKa of the citric acid. But notice that this one is 10 times more concentrated, right? There's one molar of each as opposed to 0.1 molar of the two. So what we say is that buffer B has 10 times the buffer capacity of buffer A. So if you take samples of both of those identical samples, let's say I take 10 ml of buffer A and 10 ml of buffer B. And to both of them I add 5 ml of HCl or sodium hydroxide. The more concentrated one will maintain the pH closest to the original than the one that is um, the more dilute one. So the, the, the change in pH that will be observed by adding the same amount of acid will be greater in the more dilute solution. Why? Because you're, you're destroying, neutralizing a greater amount of the buffering species that are present in that solution because it's more dilute. The more concentrated one has a better ability to withstand changes in pH, and therefore we say it has a greater buffer capacity. Okay. So the, the, as I've been saying, he, the physiology one of the one of the primary roles of uh, physical homeostasis is to maintain that pH within that very narrow range of 7.35 to 7.45, and it's all these buffering species that are in our bodily fluids that maintain that, and they need to be maintained at a proper concentration such that any acids or bases that enter our bodily fluids, which are coming at all times from metabolism, from all sorts of exposures and things, that concentration needs to be proper to truly allow for that optimal buffer capacity so that our pH doesn't go too high or too low and that can lead to all sorts of problems. So if you look at the third buffer that's shown here, buffer C, this one has 0.1 molar, sodium citrate, but it has one molar citric acid. This one, because the mole ratio is not one to one, I hope you can appreciate that in this case, the pH is less than the pKa, it's more acidic. Why? Because there's more of the acid than there is of the base. The fact that there is an excess of the acidic component makes the pH more acidic than the pKa. It's gonna be less. What you can also hopefully observe is that you can now distinguish between the ability of the solution, of this buffer solution, to neutralize acid versus base. Because there's more of the acidic component, this buffer has a greater capacity to neutralize added base. It has a lesser capacity to neutralize added acid because it has less of the basic component. Because it has more of the acidic component, it's better able to withstand changes in pH when this is added because there's more acid to neutralize that base that may come from an external source. Okay? All right. So these are the critical concepts of buffers. So we're now going to put this into the context of physiology. And this reaction that's at the very top of this next slide. Oh, you know what? I want to add, let me see if I can pull this question up. Um, uh, it is going to take too long to bring it up. It doesn't matter because I, I have to find that slide and it's, it's, gonna, it's just gonna take too much time. All right, so um, let's put it in the context of physiology. So this reaction that's sort of at the top of the slide, this is a, one of the most critically important reactions that's happening as we speak within our bodies to control our acid content. So CO2 is coming primarily from the metabolism, as we're going to learn, we're going to start talking about biochemistry soon, and then ultimately we're going to talk about metabolism. One of the major byproducts of metabolism is carbon dioxide, shown here on the left. Now, carbon dioxide is under the control of the lungs. The lungs has, uh, have the ability to, depending on how fast and or uh, uh, deep uh, the breaths you take are, that has the ability to control how much CO2 
is allowed to remain or, ex or is exhaled from the body. Now, CO2, as it is used, of course, a portion of it goes towards the lungs and the lungs controls that. Uh, the, the other portion primarily reacts with the water that's contained in every bodily fluid that your, contains your body, right? And initially, uh, carbonic acid, which is this substance that's in the middle, is produced. Now, carbonic acid turns out to be a reasonably unstable compound, and it very uh, promptly will ionize uh, to convert itself into protons, which is acid, and bicarbonate. Now, the kidneys have then the ability to control the amount of acid and bicarbonate, and depending on how much they reabsorb versus allow to be excreted, that then maintains that proper concentrations of protons to bicarbonate. And ultimately, the goal is to maintain a very particular concentration of H+, which is what determines our pH of our bodily fluids, okay? So there are certain pathological situations that can happen in which the concentration of protons, which is what determines the pH of our bodily fluids, can change. And then these uh, changes in pH typically lead to some kind of a physiological response, which we call compensation. And the goal of that compensation is to restore that protons to near normal, because remember, as we've just said, buffers are not perfect. They do not maintain a constant pH. They maintain pH with a very narrow range. And as with all buffers, all physiological buffers aim to get to that point. So this is why our bodily pH is not exactly 7.35. It's in that range between 7.5 and 7.45, constantly fluctuating. But as long as it doesn't go too low before below the lower limit or too high above the higher limit, our bodily functions continue normally. So it's always a, a little bit of a, of a swing back and forth between those two values, and it's the constant reactions of these bodily buffers that are you know, maintaining that pH within that near normal range. So some terminology that you may have learned about in previous courses, um, we're gonna now talk about it in a little bit more detail in, a, in terms of a chemical concept, content. So acidosis is any pathological state that leads to an increase in the amount of acid in your bodily fluids, as opposed to an alkalosis, which is any pathological state that leads to a decrease, uh, a decrease in the amount of acid in your bodily fluids. So notice how we never speak of content of base. Pretty much all acid-base content uh, study working with you know, all of that is typically focused on the content of the acid. Even the, even, even if we're running into a basic direction, we always speak of less acid as opposed to more base. So it's very, very common to focus on the acidic components, even if we're talking about things that are heading in the basic direction. So alkalosis, less acid, acidosis, more acid. Now, typically, your body will respond, will compensate, attempt to anyway. And um, the acidoses are compensated with alkaloses, and they try to balance each other out. So again, in order to try to bring this uh, concentration of protons to that near normal value. So when, you, when that compensation ensues and it's working or attempting to anyway, and if it doesn't reach a complete um, compensation and you have a net elevation in your uh, hydrogen ion concentration, then we call that an acidemia. It's so different than acidosis. Acidosis is a process that leads to increase in protons. You can have an acidosis simultaneously existing with an alkalosis, and they may balance each other out, and you may end up with a normal pH. You, then you don't have acidemia or alkalemia, which is the opposite. Alkalemia will be when you have a net decrease in hydrogen ion concentration because these counterbalancing uh, processes are not perfectly working in sync with each other, and it turns out that you may have a net a decrease in that hydrogen ion concentration, and that would then lead to an alkalemia, a little bit higher pH than you would uh, normally want. So let's let's dissect this in terms of different specific 
conditions, and we're going to see how the response happens. This is all based on the Chatelier's principle. So let's say that you have a situation or disease or whatever it is that leads to a decrease in the respiratory rate and or depth. And when that happens, what that leads is to an accumulation of the CO2. So your CO2 is suddenly going up because your lungs are not responding properly, you've taken a medication or a toxin that, that reduces your respiratory rate, and then because the lungs is where this control happens, if you're breathing too slowly and not deeply enough, or a combination of those two, then that leads to an accumulation of your CO2. So your CO2 goes up by Le Chatelier's principle, then of course this is going to shift to the right. So what does that do? That leads to an increase in the amount of protons, it also leads to an increase in the amount of bicarbonate. In terms of acid content, the main problem here is that we have sudden, uh, it doesn't have to be sudden, but we have, a let's say, gradual, it could be sudden, if you suddenly stop breathing, right? Um, whether it's sudden or not, you have an increase in the amount of protons in your bodily fluids simply because of a response, chemical response associated with an increase in CO2 that came from the fact that your lungs are sort of not working properly, right? So this is what we call the rest respiratory acidosis. It's called respiratory because the origin of that accumulation of protons comes from a malfunction, dysfunction of your lungs. Your, your, your respiratory system is the one that's the source of that uh, accumulation of protons that comes directly from the accumulation of the CO2. So that's called respiratory acidosis. So what does the body do? In response, this is now a physiological response, to try to maintain that constant protons what happens is that the kidneys, I'm going to change colors now, the kidneys suddenly start to further increase. The kidneys dump, they recover more bicarbonate from the filtration apparatus of the, of the kidneys that comes back into the circulation. Well, now what happens is that that is sudden, again, doesn't have to be sudden, gradual or sudden increase in bicarbonate. Now you're, cha you're affecting this equilibrium on the right side and something's going up on the right side. What's going to happen? This is going to shift back to the left, right? And what that does is brings this back down. So notice there was an up arrow, there was a down arrow. What does the ultimate outcome? That leads to a returning of the proton concentration to near normal. It's not always 100% perfect. But as long as it goes back to that 7.35 to 7.45 range, then you're back to normal, right? So this is what is known as a compensatory metabolic alkalosis. It's an alkalosis regard to metabolism because you're increasing the concentration of a basic substance, which is bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is the conjugate base of carbonic acid, right? Conjugate base of carbonic acid. You see why all this terminology that we start at the beginning is so important? Because it's, we're talking about these things naturally, and you need to understand what these terms mean. So bicarbonate is the conjugate base of carbonic acid. It's a basic substance in this context. So you're increasing that basic substance. This is now a metabolic alkalosis. But the, the ultimate result is that this it went up and it goes down again and it comes down back to that sort of near normal range. So this is uh, respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation in the form of a metabolic alkalosis, okay? All right, so what's, what are there several other scenarios? So what about if you have a situation in which there's a net gain for whatever reason, there's a net gain in the number of protons, so this could be going up, or bicarbonate could be going down. So let's look at it individually so that we can then uh, analyze, let me go back to red, analyze the situation. So if you have either an increase in protons or a decrease in bicarbonate, either of those mechanisms will cause um, an increase in, uh, in the uh, proton concentration. And this is what is known as a metabolic acidosis. So when you have a net gain of protons, Suddenly, this is going up, right? So what's going to happen? How do we make it go to the left to get rid of those protons? So what happens is that the lungs suddenly start hyperventilating. You start uh, breathing a little bit faster. You can also breathe a little bit deeper, any combination of those two things. And then what that does, because now the lungs are breathing faster, CO2 is going out through the lungs. So this starts going down by virtue of that uh, hyperventilation, if you will, the, the faster and or deeper breathing. So more CO2 is lost because one of the substances on the far left of this reaction is going 
down, what that does is that it shifts the equilibrium to the left. And then if you notice what went up ultimately comes down, that then brings this back to a reasonably normal uh, concentration, okay? So the alternative uh, situation would be if you have a net loss of bicarbonate. So if bicarbonate is being lost uh, in this process, something on the right side of the equation is being lost. So what does this do? This is going to shift the reaction to the left. So notice this is going to cause this to uh, go up to sort of compensate for, and, and when I say compensate in this context, it's not physiological compensation. It's just a, the shift of the equilibrium to the right is, let's use a different word. It's going to counterbalance the loss of the bicarbonate by moving to the right, well, what that ultimately causes is this going up a little bit, right? So as that acid is starting to accumulate, what are the lungs going to do? Again, they're going to initiate deeper and or faster breathing. And with that um, mechanism, now physiological, that causes the uh, shift of the reaction to the left. Why? Because when in doing so, the CO2 starts to be blown out. And in doing so, then shift the equilibrium back to the left. What happens to the acid? The acid goes back down. So what has happened? Regardless, this went up and it went down. And ultimately, what we lead to is to the restoration of this near normal uh, pro, uh, proton, uh, hydrogen ion or proton concentration. So we call this a metabolic acidosis because the source of protons and or the loss of bicarbonate is causing changes in these uh, substances that are in solution. They're technically byproducts of metabolism. And therefore, because they result in a decrease in pH due to the initial increase in the amount of protons, we call that a metabolic acidosis. The increase in the faster deeping and, and deeper breathing rate, which is the compensation, we call that a respiratory compensation. So again, as those lungs start operating faster and or deeper, the CO2 is going down, getting blown away, and that ultimately shifts the equilibrium back to the left, ultimately bringing the acid content back down to within that near normal range, okay? There's another scenario in which you can have a problem with your respiratory centers. So again, not only are there certain drugs, toxins, substances that you may be exposed to that causes a uh, depression of your respiratory centers. There are others, some stimulants, some drugs that are associated with, you know, inducing hyperactivity or, or anxiety or whatever. Your respiratory rate suddenly starts to go up and your depth of breathing starts to go up. So if you have a condition that leads to an increase, increase in your respiratory rate. So what's going to happen is your lungs are operating at a higher capacity. The CO2 uh, starts to go down. And what does that do? Well, everything shifts to the left. So shift to the left means that this is going to go down and this is going to go down. Okay. So that decrease in, she and, and CO2 ultimately starts to consume some of that proton and that bicarbonate. So the body has to somehow compensate by bringing back those substances, particularly the protons, because those are the ones that determine pH. So this is known as a respiratory alkalosis because that decrease in protons concentration is a direct result of something going on with your lungs. Your lungs are breathing faster and or deeper, and that's what leads to that decrease in the proton concentration. So what happens? The physiological response will be that the kidneys are going to start to excrete even more. Let me change colors here they're going to excrete even more bicarbonate, and then that is going to ultimately shift the uh, equilibrium back to the right. So that additional bicarbonate loss is known as a compensatory metabolic acidosis. It's a metabolic acidosis because a metabolite, a bicarbonate, its concentration is going down. When you're losing a basic substance, technically you're, you're in operating under a situation of less base. So less base makes it a more acidic environment. That's why it's called a compensatory metabolic acidosis. Ultimately, what's going to happen is that's going to cause that proton to go up and then again goes down and then it goes back up and the system is back to, again, within near normal, near normal uh, pH, uh, i.e. hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, and then of course the last scenario would be a situation in which you have, for whatever reason, a net loss or a 
uh, gain, and they can, they can be simultaneous, net loss and or gain of bicarbonate. So this is going down and or this is going up for whatever reason. So in both situations, if you're losing acid or gaining base, we call that a metabolic alkalosis. If it's the, subs the pure substances be uh, either one loss or the other gain for whatever reason. So again, the, the compensatory mechanism comes from the opposite side, which is from the lungs. If you have a net loss of protons, what the body then starts doing is that it starts to initiate a slower, shallower breathing because what that does is then the CO2, let me change colors, the CO2 starts to then uh, accumulate as your lungs are breathing slower and or uh, shallower, that causes this equilibrium to shift to the right. So that proton content that was lost is now regained. And again, you've managed to uh, restore that protons to near normal. In the case of net gain of bicarbonate, initially, again, the equilibrium uh, will, uh, will shift to the left. That's, let, me, let me erase this so that it's not, so that it's clear. Right? If you suddenly have an increase in the bicarbonate concentration, this is going to shift to the left. So this is going to be consumed. This, the consequence is that, that this goes down. So what happens? Again, the lungs will initiate that slower and or shallower breathing. That's suddenly going to lead to the accumulation of CO2 because your lungs are operating at a sort of a slower pace. And then that's going to shift the equilibrium back to the right. What does that do if it shifts back to the right? The acid is going to go up. So it initially went down goes up again. The bicarbonate will also go up. That's not the point, right? The point is the acid that comes back up and it's going to ultimately restore that pH. So I just want you to observe how the CO2 and the bicarbonate sort of go in the same direction. And this is true for all scenarios because the, the, when one is high, the other one has to compensate and also become high. When one's low, CO2 is low, well, the bicarbonate will compensate by also becoming low. And at that point, regardless of the mechanism of the three or four mechanisms that we've been discussing, the ultimate goal is, to th is for this one in the middle right here. This is the one that needs to ultimately return to that near normal, right? Near normal over here, right? And that's what then maintains your, your bodily pH that allows you to continue li living and breathing and walking. All right, let's see what else is here. So, oh, this, this little table here, and I think this is the last slide, this little table over here um, is simply sort of a little summary slide that is illustrating, uh, sort of summarizing some of these concepts. So it's giving you some additional information. Again, we, I've been saying, repeating like a broken record, the, the pH range. So here it is, right? The normal pH is um, between 7.35, 7.45. If you look, if you measure the amount of CO2 in your blood normally, because CO2 is a gas, and if you recall from Henry's law, you can directly correlate uh, pressure with concentration. It's very, very common to um, report, even if they're in solution, technically there's no such concept as a measuring pressure of a gas in a solution because that's when they're in the gas phase. But because you can directly measure and, and correlate pressure with concentration, it's very common to report pressures, uh, amounts of gases in solution in units of pressure. So what turns out to, have to be the case is that um, the amount of CO2 that's present dissolved in your bodily fluids normally is the direct result of a pressure of CO2 outside of those fluids that is between 35 and 45 torr on the surface of the liquid. So then we, sim we simply say, oh, the pressure of CO2 is in your, in your fluid is 35 to 45 torr. This is how it's reported. And for those of you who are going to be taking care of patients in a real live uh, clinical setting, um, even when you're doing rounds and for the nurses in pillar and, and even the MLS people who are reporting these types of things, you're going to be looking at lab reports and CO2 levels are, and, and other gases, oxygen as well, uh, are reported in units of pressure. So you need to understand that when you look at a patient who has a PCO2 that is, you know, 40, that's normal because it's within the range. If you have a PCO2 of 20 torr, then that's not good. That's outside the range, right? It's too low. And then um, the bicarbonate concentration, because it's a, it's a metabolite, it's a solute, it's reported in uh, typically millimoles. 
millimoles in this case and milli equivalents are the same. Remember the charge is minus one, so it's exactly the same. Depending on what lab is reporting the data, um, it can be reported in terms of millimoles per liter or milli equivalents per liter. In this case, it's exactly the same thing. So just to summarize, again, if you realize acidosis, regardless of whether it's respiratory or alkalosis, notice associated with a lower pH. Now, if it's respiratory, if it's a respiratory acidosis, what that is the result of is of an accumulation of CO2, right? You're going to have a high CO2. So we're talking about PCO2s of 50s and 60s and something of the sort, high pressures of CO2. It's, been, it's accumulated. And then what that, what that leads to is the body compensating. Notice how I mentioned in the previous slide how bicarbonate will, in, in, in line, also increase. And ultimately, these two will go in the same direction. Why? Because that's, that, that is what maintains that pH in that normal range. If you're looking at metabolic acidosis, then again, it's the lower bicarbonate that is the culprit. And ultimately, the body will start hyperventilating or whatever it is um, to lower that PCO2 um, by you know, exhaling more um, carbon dioxide, ultimately bringing them both to a lower value, right? And then ultimately, that's what maintains that ratio of uh, protons, not ratio, the, the, the concentration of protons in that particular range that it needs to be. The exact opposite happens for alkalosis. Again, if you notice, alkalosis means more base, so pH has to be higher. If it's respiratory alkalosis, the problem is that you have uh, too little CO2. And then the body, of course, is going to compensate by getting rid of bicarbonate. Ultimately, these two are going to fall within a lower range of what they originally were. That's what maintains that proton concentration where it needs to be. And then in the case of a metabolic situation, you have an accumulation of a basic substance, which is bicarbonate. That's why it's metabolic. The body will compensate by you know, slower breathing, deeper, uh, shallower breathing, et cetera, in order to increase that PCO2. And that's, again, that high and high ratio is what's going to determine um, the the um, the pH. So I mean, back to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Again, this is the base. This is the acid. So again, technically, the A minus over H A for this equation is in fact carbonate over CO two, right? And it's not uncommon. Technically, it should be this, but it's actually ultimately extrapolated to this. And again, that ratio is what uh, needs to be maintained. That's why if one goes up, the other one needs to go up. If one goes down, the other one needs to go down because it's this ratio that needs to be maintained near normal, near the same, not near normal. The ratio needs to be the same. So if one goes up, the other one has to go up. If one goes down, the other one has to go down. And then that's what ultimately maintains the pH because again, pH equals pKa plus the log of the base over acid. If the bicarbonate goes up, the CO2 has to go up. If the bicarbonate goes down, the CO2 has to go down, such that ultimately the pH is maintained within that whatever constant. The pKa is it's a little bit more complicated for the case of physiological buffers. There's many, many, many acids dissolved in your fluids. It's sort of an average pKa of all of them, right? And it turns out that that average pKa of all of them is in that 7.3 to 7.4 range, as long as the ratio of bicarbonate to CO2 remains constant or near constant, the pH of your bodily fluids is not going to change much. Okay? All right. So that's that chapter. Let me now share. So a couple things. Our quiz, which we have a quiz next Monday, is going to be up to this point. So only chapter seven. We're not including anything from chapter 10 or the stereochemistry concepts in the upcoming quiz. Because there's some math, there's some concepts that are a little bit, um, you know, tough to digest. Um, and we and because of all the present circumstances, I know everybody's been a little bit stressed out and whatnot. So we're gonna just limit this quiz to only chapter seven to kind of keep the, the concepts together. So the next quiz, not the one that's coming, but the one after, this is what then uh, stereochemistry and, and carbohydrates um, is going to contain. So we're now, we're, we're, Next week is quiz four. So the last two quizzes, five and six, are going to be pretty much containing all of biochemistry. And then it's going to wrap up on the final exam. All right. So let's now 
um, will there be structures on the exam? I'm trying to think, because we're actually building the, the exam right now. I believe yes. Let me just answer that question. Yes. Uh, yes. There will be some structures for you to analyze, okay, based on what on the concepts that we've discussed. Hello. My thing is not going in, but anyway, I've said it. All right. So let's um, move on to chapter 10. Let me see if this one is going to work um, better than the other one. Oh, boy. Yes, it will be. And let me just say, um, oh, boy, this is not working. I'm going to have to go to the PDF. The, the, the quiz will be set up in a similar fashion. The lab practicum was our first attempt at doing this. Um, we noticed some little couple of snafus, and we sincerely apologize. Um, now that we are aware of these little things that we need to be very aware of, um, then we are working extremely hard to ensure that these types of things do not happen again. So we're trying to minimize question X related to question Y. And if there is such a situation, we're either trying to put them together into one or we're explicitly giving information that you need for both, within both, so that you don't have to be tracking back and forth and, you know, oh, this question depends on another one. So if you get that one first, go back, that type of thing. We're trying to fix all that. Um, what we also need to do um, is that we need to take the exam to, 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 to see, oh, there's an issue here. Oh, we need this information, right? Um, which unfortunately it seems like that fell through the cracks for the lab practicum. So we are ensuring hopefully that for the upcoming quiz, we're not gonna have those issues. Um, so again, but bear with us because this is all new to us. We've never done these exams on, on, on this type of platform. So as much as we try to anticipate the issues that may come up and we try to in advance try to not have them you know sometimes we just can't avoid things that suddenly come up as we're, as we're running things live um so that, that that's that's uh, somebody asked a question what was the last question sorry i was talking too much um will we have another sapling before this exam no the, well you, technically yes the uh, an assignment goes out today remember the new timeline is uh the assignments will open Mondays at 3.30 and they're due on Sunday at midnight. So an assignment will go out, will go live today at 3.30 um, and that, no, yesterday. What's today? It went out yesterday. Sorry, we should have sent, an, now that you say that, I should have sent, we should have sent an announcement. So an assignment went out yesterday. It's a short assignment. I think it's 10 problems that will wrap up the asset base content and that's all that's there. There's nothing else and that's due next Sunday and that wraps up the material for the upcoming quiz. So the, any new assignment will go out next Sunday, and that will be pertaining to what we start talking about today. Okay? Um, you will be... Yes, there should be some... Yes, actually, not, no, because this is from a different textbook. We do have a set of practice problems um, that we will distribute very, very soon, which are sort of similar to the types of things you may see on the actual quiz. So stay tuned for that. Something else that I have to add to my to-do list, but it's, it's coming. So no worries. Just just hang on for that. All right. So this, this file is not working because it's enormous. Oh, you know what? I just need to zoom out. I think that's the issue. Hello. That was my issue. All right. There we go. Another question. Oh, no. That was just a thank you. You're welcome. All right. So carbohydrates. So because carbohydrates, as with all um, biological structures, they have very unique structural features. We need to discuss, before we actually embark on carbohydrates, we need to talk about principles of what we call stereochemistry. So again, learning objectives are here for you. There's also a packet that is pretty much verbatim following the slides. There's about 55 slides associated with this with these stereochemistry concepts. There's about 14 pages of that file that's posted on Blackboard, and they follow the slides pretty much to the letter. Um, so with that packet and with these slides, you're gonna get a, a brief introduction. We can do 
entire semester courses of stereochemistry. It's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting concept. It's an important concept. We're going to give you sort of a little bit of a flavor in a couple of lectures so that you can get these concepts that are going to be critical to understand uh, things related to biological molecules, things related to pharmaceuticals, and other concepts that we're going to be talking about as we go through the course. So we need to define, there's going to be a lot of new terminology in this particular section that's going to carry us through the remainder of the course because these concepts are going to come up not only for carbohydrates, they're going to come up from when we start, to start talking about lipids and in particular amino acids and proteins, um, which once we talk about all those three uh, biological substances, then is when we're going to be ultimately moving on to metabolism, where we put it all together. If we have time, not sure that we're going to have time. If we have time at the end of the course, we're going to talk a little bit about DNA and RNA and, and some molecular genetics. These concepts are not that critical for that, but it is critical for the other three pieces that we're going to start embarking in very soon. So stereoisomers is another category of isomers. And if you recall, we've spoken of constitutional isomers, which are substances that have the same formula, because that's, what's made, that's what makes them isomers. but the order of connectivity of the atoms that make up their structure is completely different. Things are connected in a different way, and therefore these are those are completely different compounds. Talk about stereoisomers, however, it's an interesting concept that we're talking about isomers that are different compounds, but if you follow the connectivity of their atoms and their skeletons, they are exactly the same. If you, if you ignore three-dimensional shape and you're only following atom to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, just following the, the skeleton, the skeleton is identical. Everything's joined to exactly the same thing in exactly the same order. But what is different, this is when you now have to consider three-dimensional shape because we are three-dimensional entities as humans, as everything that's in the universe. If you go down to the molecular level, Everything that makes up the universe are also made up of particles that have three-dimensional shapes. In the case of these stereoisomers, what's different between them is not how things are connected, but where things are pointing in three dimensions. Okay? So there's two major categories of stereoisomers. The first one is what we call enantiomers. And enantiomers are stereoisomers that are mirror images of each other, but they are not the same. So meaning that if you have both objects in front of you and you're handling them, if you try to put one on top of the other, they're not going to match. Things will not fall in the same place. So it's kind of hard to fathom, but if you right now put your hands one in front of each other as if you were praying, and if you separate them, you'll notice that they are mirror images of each other. Okay? But if you try to Put them one on top of each other, not as you're praying, but simply one on top of each other. You'll notice, in the same direction, I mean, you'll notice that things don't match. One thumb is going to be to the left, the other thumb is going to be to the right, and the other four fingers are not going to match. Okay, so your hands are an example of a pair of enantiomers. Okay, now they're nearly identical, they both have five fingers thumb index, the middle finger, whatever, right? But they're different. They're not the same. There are mirror images that are not superimposable. Now, the alternative is everything connected in the same way, but they're not mirror images of each other, okay? So that one is a little bit harder to fathom. We're going to see examples of this. But whenever you have structures, and we're going to see examples, where things are connected in the same way, in the same order, but they're not mirror images of each other on top of that, then the only thing you can say about them is that they are diastereomers. Okay? Now, when you compare enantiomers, which must exist in pairs, because an object and its mirror image are only two things, right? Um, they are, it turns out, they're nearly identical in all of their chemical and physical properties. Because of the fact that they are mirror images that are not identical, they, are, they actually behave differently when they are interacting with other objects that, like them, are also asymmetric. So I already started jumping ahead, 
but what makes an object have an enantiomer out there is the fact that it is not symmetric. So if you look at your hand, everybody look at their hand, you'll notice that your hands are not symmetric. There's no way that you can cut your hand into two equal pieces because they're not symmetric, right? The left side is different than the right side. And if you look at your right hand, it's the same thing. You can't cut it into two equal pieces. So the fact that your hands are not symmetric is what then make them necessarily have to exist as a pair of enantiomers that are mirror images that are not the same, okay? Very, very similar properties only when they interact with other substances that can also exist as enantiomers. That's when they behave differently. But otherwise, they're nearly identical. Diastereomers, because they are very different, it turns out, that they are completely different compounds. They have different chemical properties, different physical properties, and they behave quite differently regardless of the environment. So just, um, I've already alluded to this. This is just a little picture of putting this together. Enantiomers arise whenever a structure lacks a plane of symmetry. It does not have it. If you cannot slice the structure into two mirror image halves, then the substance, then, then the object does not have a plane of symmetry. The, the object that's shown here in the middle of the slide, this one does have, in fact, two planes of symmetry shown here in the sort of greenish color and the yellowish color. You'll notice that that object, the way that it's drawn, you can cut it into two pieces in two different directions. And because it has a plane of symmetry, it turns out that the object and its mirror image are actually identical. When an object is symmetric, it will be identical to its mirror image. I'm gonna to attempt to draw the object down here again. Imagine there's a mirror here in the middle. Imagine this is a mirror, right? And, and they're both mirror images of each other. So observe, sorry that's my bad chicken scratch drawing, but observe that if, if you pick up the object on the right, let me change colors. If I pick up the object and try to put it on top of that one, everything will match. Everything will, be, will fall on top of the other, right? So they're perfectly symmetrical. Therefore, that object and its mirror image are exactly the same. They're not enantiomers. They are identical. Only when an object lacks symmetry is when they're not identical. So <laughs> because enantiomers are mirror images, this is what I said earlier, they must exist in pairs. Any asymmetric object can have one and only one enantiomer, okay? If the object is symmetric, as I've already illustrated, the object and its mirror image are the same, the concept of the existence of enantiomers completely disappears. Now, as we've established, diastereomers are a different category. While an object can only have one enantiomer if it is asymmetric, it turns out it can have multiple diastereomers because these do not have a mirror image relationship. So we're gonna see many examples of substances that are diastereomers and they're all kinds of different versions of the same structure that can be diastereomers, but an object can only have one enantiomer, okay? So again, back to the hands. Here's an example. Here's a baseball glove. There, there are left-handed baseball gloves and there are right-handed baseball gloves, right? And jumping ahead a little bit, alluding to why this is important, if you were to close your eyes and put your hand. Did somebody ask me a question? What's the image looking through the back and front side? Wouldn't that mean? No. The, so to answer Jacob's question, um, you can draw it in different ways depending on where you're standing and looking at it. So this, this is alluding to that you can have an object when it's being projected in a mirror. The object can be can have a mirror in front of it, can have a mirror behind it, can have a mirror under it. Depending on where the mirror is, is how the mirror image looks like. But regardless of where the mirror is around the object, there's only one mirror image, and there's only one substance. And all of those images that may be seen, depending on where the mirror is, are identical. The ones that are in the mirrors are all identical. All right. So 
back to this. You close your eyes and you put your right hand in the right-handed glove versus the left-handed glove. You will, without having to open your eyes, you will immediately realize if your right hand is in the correct glove. So if your right hand in the right glove, it's going to feel right. If your right hand is in the left glove, it's not going to feel right because it's not it's the right fit. Now, they're both gloves, but it's not the right fit. So the reason why this is why we talk about this is because when we talk about biological molecules, when we talk about pharmaceuticals, they are all asymmetric. And the right shape has the right fit in your biological receptors if the wrong structure enters your body and interact with your asymmetric receptors the response is not the same so we'll get to this at some point and it'll make more sense once we get to that point but the whole point is that just like your hands are not symmetric just like your feet are not symmetric right back to this if you're running to late to class in the morning and you're trying to put your shoes on in the dark and you put your right foot in the left shoe you're going to know right away that that's not the right shoe because it's not the right it's not the correct match right so whenever a substance is asymmetric and therefore is not identical to its mirror image the object is said to be chiral so c h i r a l pronounced chiral chiral okay so remember that term because we're going to be talking about that term pretty much for the remainder of the course. Your hands are chiral, your feet are chiral. This object, however, is achiral. Achiral means that the object is symmetric and that the object and its mirror image are identical. There's no concept of enantiomers because they're the same. If you imagine a mirror here, right, I mean these two, and as they do in these horror movies, you imagine your hand going into the mirror, right? And pulling the mug of the mirror out of the mirror, right? And you put it on top of the other mug, everything will match perfectly. Therefore, every, every object has a mirror image. You can put anything you want in front of a mirror and you're gonna see the mirror image. The question is, is the mirror image of that object the same as the object or is it different? So if the object is perfectly symmetric, the object and the mirror image will be identical, the concept of chirality disappears. But if they're not symmetric, right, as what happens with your hands and your feet and these baseball gloves, if you imagine a mirror here and you go to the mirror and pull that one out and try to put it on top of this one, nope, it's not gonna match. They're different, okay? All right. So. Just to kind of, we have about another few minutes left. I just want to put this down into the text of molecules, which is what we're going to start talking about soon. So the actual most common source of chirality in molecules, in structures that are at the molecular level, that, everything that makes up your body. Well, it turns out it's the presence of a tetrahedral atom, meaning has a tetrahedral molecular geometry and it has to have four, one, two, three, four distinct groups bonded to that tetrahedral atom. Whenever that happens, when, when you identify a tetrahedral atom within a structure, and that atom has four distinct attachments, four different things bonded to it, that is known as a chiral or chirality center. That is the most common source of asymmetry in molecules, in biological molecules. And if you pay attention, sorry that it's getting a little bit cut off there, but if you look at that structure that's shown in the middle there, so notice that carbon there right here is tetrahedral and it has a pink and a green and a blue and an orange. Imagine a mirror in the middle. Look in the mirror, pay attention to the mirror. This, this is another piece of the course where paying attention to detail is critical. If you notice, blue, pink, orange, green, that's the mirror image. So again, try to put your hand in the mirror, pull it out, try to put it on top of the one on the left. It turns out 
that if you try to superimpose them, they are not going to match. Two of the pieces will match, but two of them will never match. Does it matter if you try to rotate it this way, that way, the other way? They will never match. Again, try with your hands. Put your hands one in front of each other. Does it matter how you try to put them one on top of the other? The thumbs will not match. The index fingers will not match. Nothing will match. It's because of the asymmetry. All right? All right, so we'll end there for today. We will then continue with these concepts on Thursday. Um, this co these concepts are not on the upcoming quiz. An assignment has gone live as of yesterday afternoon. You will get practice problems that are, are going to be going on at some point soon for the, for the upcoming quiz. All right? Everybody have a great day, and we will talk to you again on Thursday.